Hello, I am Philosophical, and this is part two of the introduction to Sacred Economics by Charles Eisenstein, which is an absolutely paradigm-shattering book. I highly recommend it, and I'll post some links to his website. Here's part two of the introduction. That is why reductionist science seems to rob the world of its sacredness, since everything becomes one, an, one or another combination of a handful of generic building blocks. This conception mirrors our own economic system, itself consisting mainly of standardized generic commodities, job descriptions, processes, data, inputs and outputs, and most generic of all, money, the ultimate abstraction. In earlier times it was not so. Tribal people saw each being not primarily as a member of a category, but as a unique and spirited individual. Even rocks, clouds, and seemingly identical drops of water were thought to be sentient, unique beings. The products of the human hand were unique as well, bearing through their distinguishing irregularities the signature of the maker. Here was the link between the two qualities of the sacred, connectedness and uniqueness. Unique objects retain the mark of their origin, their unique pl place in the great matrix of being, their dependency on the rest of creation for their existence. Standardized objects, commodities, are uniform and therefore disembedded from their relationship. In this book, I will describe a vision of a money system and an economy that is sacred, that embodies the interrelatedness and the uniqueness of all things. No longer will it be separate, in fact or in perception, from the natural matrix which underlies it. It reunites the long sundered realms of human and nature. It is an extension of ecology that obeys all of its laws and bears all of its beauty. Within every institution of our civilization, no matter how ugly or corrupt, there is the germ of something beautiful, the same note at a higher octave. Its original purpose is simply to connect human gifts with human needs so that we might all live in greater abundance. How instead has money come to generate scarcity rather than abundance, separation rather than connection, is one of the threads of this book. Yet despite what it has become in that original ideal of money as an agent of the gift, we can catch a glimpse of what will one day make it sacred again. We recognize the exchange of gifts as a sacred occasion, which is why we instinctively make a ceremony out of giving. Sacred money, then, will be a medium of giving, a means to imbue the global economy with the spirit of the gift that governs tribal and village cultures and still does today wherever people do things for each other outside the money economy. Sacred economics describes this future and also maps out a practical way to get there. Long ago, I grew tired of reading books that criticize some aspect of our society without offering a positive alternative. 
Then I grew tired of books that offered a positive alternative that seemed impossible to reach. We must reduce carbon emissions by 90%. Then I grew tired of books that offered a plausible means of reaching it, but did not describe what I, personally, could do to create it. Sacred economics operates on all four levels. It offers a fundamental analysis of what has gone wrong with money. It describes a more beautiful world based on a different kind of money and economy. It explains the collective actions necessary to create that world and the means by which these actions can come about. It also explores the personal dimensions of the world transformation, the change in identity and being that I call living in the gift. A transformation of money is not a panacea for the world's ills, nor should it take priority over other forms of activism. A mere rearrangement of bits on a computer will not wipe away the very material and social devastation afflicting our planet. Yet, neither can the healing work in any other realm achieve its potential without a corresponding transformation of money. So deeply is it woven into our social institutions and habits of life. The economic changes I describe are part of a vast, all-encompassing shift that will leave no aspect of life untouched. Humanity is only beginning to awaken to the true magnitude of the crisis on hand. If the economic transformation I will describe seems miraculous, that is because nothing less than a miracle is needed to heal our world. In all realms, from money to ecological healing, to politics, to technology, to medicine, we need solutions that exceed the present bounds of what is possible. Fortunately, as the old world falls apart, our knowledge of what is possible expands, and with it expands our courage and our willingness to act. The present convergence of crises in money, energy, education, health, water, soil, climate, politics, the environment, and more is a birth crisis, expelling us from the old world into the new. Unavoidably, these crises invade our personal lives. Our world falls apart, and we too are born into a new world a new identity. This is why so many people sense a spiritual dimension to the planetary crisis, even to the economic crisis. We sense that normal isn't coming back, that we are being born into a new normal, a new kind of society, a new relationship to the earth, a new experience of being human. I dedicate all of my work to the more beautiful world our hearts tell us is possible. I say our hearts because our minds sometimes tell us that it is impossible. Our minds doubt things that will doubt that things will ever be much different from what experience has taught us. You may, you may have felt a wave of cynicism, contempt, or despair as you read my description of a sacred economy. You might have felt an urge to dismiss the words, 
as hopelessly idealistic. Indeed, I myself was tempted to tone down my description, to make it more plausible, more responsible, more in line with our low expectations for what life and the world could be. But such an attenuation would not have been the truth. I will, using the tools of the mind, speak what is in my heart. In my heart, I know that an, that an economy and society this beautiful are possible for us to create. And indeed, anything less than that is unworthy of us. Are we so broken that we aspire to anything less than a sacred world?